like uh, everyone's coming th coming through. So um, welcome everybody to today's um, partner panel. What we're going to be looking at is the law firm as a business and also thinking about uh, what your um, career looks like um, for those who are going to be joining the profession in the next uh, year or so. Uh, we're very lucky to have uh, a panel of distinguished guests who are going to share their wisdom with you and, um, as I say, cover, come of those, some, cover some of those topics. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's have some introductions before we start on the, uh, the meat of this. So each of the uh, panellists is just going to tell you who they are, um, uh, a little bit about the, what they actually do as lawyers and their firm. Um, so if we can just get through that, I'll start with uh, Sarah, please. Hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is Sarah Porter. I am a partner in the Structured Capital Markets team at Baker McKenzie, um, mainly working with banks and corporates on their financing structures. Um, so one of the more recent things I've just been working on is the, the restructuring of Pizza Express. So saving doubles for the nation is, is how I, I put that. Um, <laughs> for, my, for my sins, I also do um, a fair bit of grab recruitment work. Um, I'm the pro bono coordinator for our team and also I'm quite involved in a lot of the DNI stuff that's going on at Bakers. Thank you. Lucy, please. Hi, everyone. So I'm a partner at Vincent and Elkins, which is a US firm in London. I work in the finance team, predominantly doing acquisition finance, working for private equity houses like KKR and Blackstone and big banks like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs on their financing they need for their merger and acquisition transactions. And I also get involved in quite a lot of women's initiative stuff, which we're very big on at b and &E, and um, d &I initiatives. Great, thank you. Uh, Patrick. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Patrick Taylor. I'm a partner in the International Dispute Resolution Group at Devil Boys and Plimpton, also a, a US headquartered firm. Um, I specialize in international commercial arbitration and investment treaty arbitration, representing both sovereign states and investors uh, in the latter. i um, done a lot of work in the oil and gas and, and telecommunications sectors over the years. Um, I spent the formative years of my career at a magic circle firm and then moved to Devil Boys in 2014, where I'm also the trainee principal partner, looking after graduate recruitment and, and the trainees that we have at our firm. Great, thank you. And finally, Claire. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Claire Revel, a partner in the professional and financial risks team in RPC, which is part of our insurance division. Um, I specialise in the professional risks aspect um, and for my sins, I essentially defend other solicitors when they've got it a bit wrong. Um, I am also involved in our graduate recruitment and DNI programmes. Great. Well, thank you all. So let's press on. Um, first up, um, you know, as I said, we're looking at uh, law firms as businesses and that's... A, that, a, Oh, I'm having a bit of trouble there. That's that's absolutely uh, yeah. It's absolutely crucial to understand that law firms are our businesses are there to make money. So, um, Sarah, I think you're going to take us through just the uh, economics 101 of how a law firm works, how it makes money, and um, what its costs look like. Yeah. So, I mean, it's obviously a really important issue at the moment, as with with any industry, to be frank. Um, you know, with the pressures of COVID and, and impact on, on businesses. But put crudely, a law firm is, is no different from any other business, i.e. what are your costs? What is the money coming in? And then what's left over is, is profit. So you know your fixed costs, you know your salaries of, um, you know, those who work at the organisation, not just lawyers, but obviously all the amazing PAs, marketing, business development, grant recruitment, etc. all of those, those teams. Real estate and um, the offices, which is again quite an interesting um, issue at the moment with everyone virtual working and, and what does that mean for the future of how law firms operate. Um, insurance memberships, things like that are very much fixed. You've also then got some variable costs. So you've got, you know, how much money you're going to spend on marketing, on, on business development, on entertainment when we can all meet again and actually go for a meal or a drink at the pub. Um, and then what, what money is coming in? So what are we charging our, our clients? And obviously, there's been a huge amount of pressure on that. And the recently, um, organisations have got, you know, more and more rigid around cost cutting and, and legal spend tends to be something that is a fairly easy cut for, for some organisations. And there's 
increasing pressure on law firms to come up with alternative, you know, fee arrangements, so capped fees, fixed fees. As a, as a banking and finance lawyer, I would say probably 80% of what I do is actually a, a capped fee these days, as opposed to, you know, the, the somewhat more, some of my other colleagues who are in the more fortunate position of just being able to charge, you know, 10 hours of time equates to 10 times 500 or whatever it might be, and, and therein is the money. And then effectively what's left over is, is profits for the partnership. So there are, you know, very a number of variables that need to be managed at any given time. Um, and law firms have to be smart, smart to deliver work efficiently. And I'm, I'm sure we'll have some discussions around some of those issues in the next, what, 40, 40 odd minutes. Great. Well, thank, thank you very, very much. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think yeah, the, there's the, the, the basics of the law firm uh, profit and loss. But clearly, uh, one thing that is, is very apparent is law firms are very much dynamic creatures who are continually changing, um, evolving. So perhaps, Claire, you could just give us, a, give us a, an idea of how a firm might, might develop over time, why it might change the focus of what it does. Um, you know, I think Sarah mentioned differences in how billing works. Um, and so, Claire, did you, have, you, have you got that? Claire, we lost a second there. Tell you Apologies. what. Apologies, I don't know what happened in the page just reloaded, I think, and kicked me out. But, uh, okay, no problem. Um, I think you know broadly what I'm asking. How firms evolved, um, how do they change their dynamic, what do they do to keep themselves relevant, keep themselves profitable? Yes, thank you. Um, I've been in law for about 15 years now, and I think things have changed dramatically in the time that I've, that I've been there. Um, and I think there is infinitely more focus on the law firm as being a business and not just a, a profession um it's more the case when i entered into it there's a lot more focus on um partners and associates and other fee earners being able to be doing bd and all of that sort of thing um and being much more focused on a, a sort of wider wider professional uh, and business understanding um and it's quite interesting now a lot of law firms are we're not necessarily known as being the most sort of adaptive of businesses, um, sometimes a bit behind on adapting things like technology. But I think in recent times, particularly in the kind of situations that we find ourselves in now, um, law firms are really having to adapt. And, you know, the world has become a lot smaller. We're doing things a lot more virtually. Firms are having to adapt to um, having to adapt to new technological pressures. Um, we're also seeing a lot of change at the moment in things like inclusion and diversity. And I know a lot of the panel members are involved in things like that at their law firms. Um, we're finding that that's something that our clients are ever more, ever more keen on. And there's a lot more, there's a lot more pressure on firms to be rounded businesses these days. Okay. It's not a case of just doing the law and bringing the fees in. It's become a much wider entity. I'm also keen to hear about how that you know how the the range of the services you offer um, varies, I and mean, obviously you've got to have a you know for instance which which bits of a firm are important. I mean, do, do, do you consistently provide the same sort of services, or how does that change over time? I think um, again, the role of the lawyer has adapted. Um, this, it used to be that people were sort of much more spe much more broad spectrum in their roles. So you would have the high street solicitor who kind of was the family solicitor and would do whatever their clients wanted and i think firms have firms and individuals have become a lot more specialized so certainly in our firm teams have become quite specialized so even within the professional and financial risk for example at my team that's subdivided into a professional risk team and a financial risks team but i think a lot of law firms um, and rpc are no different are starting to look at things perhaps from a more sector-based way so for example we have um, a team a sort of group of teams which is the retail team and that's comprised of for example real estate lawyers um, employment lawyers corporate lawyers that sort of thing so i think firms are constantly evaluating how they approach dealing with their client base and trying to work out the best way to deal to deal with them to provide them with a one-stop solution really yeah so you're always chasing the clients you're always and you're always yeah. looking over your shoulder because other people are chasing your clients as well absolutely, absolutely. okay so um, you, you mentioned sort of high street lawyers. So this is this is one of the things that I think anybody that's researching the profession um, comes across. So L Lucy, we we know. I mean, you and I and all this panel probably are very well versed with what what we might describe as the classic classifications of types of law firm. So could you quickly run us through 
sort of what those classifications are and and perhaps give us a hint on whether they are are or they're not or are they, or are they a bit either way useful or or otherwise <laughs> The easy answer to that is, I think, yes and no, but um, let me start. So, um, Claire mentioned high street firms. So, as all of you are doing your research into firms and finding your, your way through it, you will come across these. There are high street firms which classically are on the high street, and maybe not quite so much anymore, but still classified as such by virtue of the sort of work that they do. Um, predominantly working with individuals, helping them with family situations, homes, conveyancing, that sort of thing. Um, and then beyond that, there are rather more broad classifications, things like, so you'll hear the term US firm, that really means just a firm of the US, and head, US headquarters, which has offices within the UK. So Patrick, Sarah and I are all part of US firms, so they're headquartered in different places. Um, the Magic Circle, You'll hear talk of so that's some of the larger UK based firms, including A and O, including Linklaters, Silver Circle, which sits you know purportedly just below them, but it's slightly different in that um, they, that is a sort of larger group of firms. I think the distinction between Silver Circle and Magic Circle is a little more blurred these days. They're just classifications rather than anything else, but all predominantly in the corporate sphere. Then you have national firms, which will operate throughout the country and we'll have offices all around the place and regional firms which tend to be less focused on London per se or specifically in London they will look at particular areas within the UK and I think Matt said you know is, is this a useful classification I think in a lot of ways it is because whether you have clients looking for a particular service or you have people looking to work within a particular arena within law you can see those classifications as a way to steer yourself in the right direction. A client, what, what's a client looking for? Are they looking for help with a family issue? Are they looking for help with a large corporate issue? They might pick their firm on that basis, pick that firm on the basis of the global reach because you'll see you know, a US firm, if somebody's doing a transaction with a European element and a US element, sometimes it's helpful to choose a US firm because there is a big reach into the US naturally with those. Um, but I, and, and uh, for, for all of you choosing your sort of career path, certainly you can, if you think about what you want out of your job, what do you want to focus on? Are you in the corporate arena, which might find you looking at US firms, Magic Circle, Silver Circle, more national firms, which will work in more corporate areas, high street firms, if you're looking at more of a sort of family or conveyancing type role. Um, but I think the downside is that within each of those categories, there are so many different varieties. Um, you know, Patrick is at Debevoise, that's a New York headquartered firm. My firm is Texan, those between themselves are slightly different. Sarah's at Baker's, which is much more of a sort of global firm. Um, so as I say, you know, particularly within the US firm in London arena, there are just very different models within that. So I think you have to be careful not to, you know, we, we lawyers naturally like to be able to put things in boxes in, in an orderly fashion and that's no, that's the way that all of these things come about. It's nice to be able to label everybody. But I think my thought is on that, just be careful because there is so much variation within those labels um, to be found. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think and I think one of the things that we're always trying to say is that once you've got into a broad classification, then you've got to really go down into the detail and the, the ability to distinguish is going to be the, the important one. Very briefly, Sarah, I, 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 when Lucy said, Bakers as a, U a US firm, I think. I'm sure that filled you with horror, but I mean, that's a good example. It's, um, it's a US firm. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, no, but she redeemed herself by saying we're international, so all of yeah. you wanted to go ahead. <laughs> And I think that, and I think that was one of the points we, we were just going to come back across to you is, is is actually yes Baker's is the kind of firm which which actually pr proves that these these uh, these uh, these labels are not great always because they that you you do tend to fall between them. So so th of course one of the other things about um, law firms is that they are you know like like many businesses um, always um, predicated on hopefully growing. That's how you look at a, a business being successful. And there are a number of different ways in which firms can grow. Um, they will sometimes be de defined by circumstance, um, some by strategy. So, Patrick, could you just give us a, a broad outline of how a firm might look to grow, how it's, how it's, you know, and perhaps how to appreciate a firm and, and, and look into its future? 
Sure. Um, well, I think that's a, quite a relevant question for, for the people listening today because it will tell you, give you an insight into the, the culture of, of that firm. Um, Debevoise, uh, interestingly, I mean, 150 partners, so quite a small, small firm um, by international firm standards. It looked to merge, um, uh, I'm not sure how widely known this was, but it looked to merge with Freshfields in the early 2000s and ultimately decided not to because of the fear that it would completely lose its culture. So depending on the size of the firm and sort of how major the, the merger is going to be or the merger partner is, there's always this concern about how much of your culture you will lose um, and how much you'll be able to retain. Um, the other thing is um, for people thinking about whether a firm is, is more likely to, to look at mergers or, or organic growth is, especially if it's a foreign um, headquartered firm, it will tell you something about the commitment of that firm to uh, its trainees and bringing its trainees through the ranks and ultimately into the partnership. Um, obviously, most firms will have a bit of organic growth. They'll also have some lateral investments into partner groups coming in. Um, but um, where the firms tend to have sort of um, lower levels of turnover um, and where the firms tend to have sort of longer serving people, they probably have more organic growth and slightly less um, mergers or, um, or um, lateral, lateral growth. And I think for Debra Boys, that's certainly been the case. Of course, there. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been um, seeing quite a lot of is a lot of mergers happening in this what we people describe as the mid market. Um, a lot of those mergers um, are not necessarily strategic per se, but more uh, a case of we've got to do something because under the current regime, you know, is this model for a firm working? So, what what are some of those pressures that might be on a firm to to take some radical action and and, and recast their model? Well, I mean. For, for a lot of the firms in the city, it's really been about whether or not it's possible to uh, gain a strong foothold in a new market. Um, and so a lot of the, the biggest firms have been in the magic circle, especially been considering for a long time whether it's possible to merge in order to get a good American footprint. So that's definitely one of the drivers. Um, the other drivers is where you're where you're where you've got complementary practices um, and um, you can essentially benefit by, by growing, by, by merging, cut your costs and, and ultimately increase the, the, the profit pool. But I think in every single case, there will be different drivers for what a firm might be thinking about as to why it might want to merge with another firm and, or, or might not in, in many circumstances. And, and actually, law firm mergers is probably one of the most common things where you see a headline, you know, firms looking to move and then it doesn't go ahead. Um, it's, they're, not, they're not easy things to do because people are very protective of their own culture. Sure, absolutely, and 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 it's well known that um, you know, there's many a merger where people years later can still tell which legacy firm the person each a given person had come from. So, and and I think this this brings us to our next uh, point of discussion, which uh, Sarah, if you if you could comment on, um, a firm's culture is one of the things that really distinguishes a firm. Um, how do we look into that firm's culture? Yeah, so I think some of it's rooted in the history, and I think you know Patrick and Lucy talking about some, you know, the American history of, of, of their firms and, and coming into London. Um, where did it start from? What does what does a law firm aspire to? And, and you know, you can read some of the stuff on, on websites, legal websites, and that, that you can get an indication of that. Some of that's proclaimed values of the firm. So at Baker's, we've got certain principles that every office in in the network sort of ascribes to in terms of culture, of friendship, and recognition of local local culture as, as opposed to the broader the broader whole um, collaboration is is a key one and a large part of it and actually the more fundamental part of it is is who are the people what do they do and, and how do they treat each other so you know what are the expectations around work life balance what is the expectations around work allocation is it a culture where everyone's working to a common goal or is it you know if you do well you yourself benefit from that does everyone go out on a Friday night or do you not? And, and, and different things suit different people. And that is very much ingrained within the culture. And it is not immediate. It's not always easy to find that out um, sort of right from, from looking at glossy marketing materials, because law firms are very good and hire very good people to, to set out why they are such great law firms. And so it, it can be difficult to, to pinpoint some of that. And, you know, there are lots of sources available, you know, attending things like that, looking at the role on Friday surveys or 
whatever it is. You know, how, how well have we butted up the junior associates to say great things about our law firms or not? But actually, more importantly, it's about speaking to people and really trying to have the opportunity to understand what is it that they really value about the law firm at which at which they work. And I think unless you are able to do that, it can be quite difficult to, to really discern the differences between some of the firms. I, I can't hear I, I, Apologies for that. I turned off my mic because I was making a horrible booming noise. So yeah, speaking to the speaking to the people at the firm, I think is absolutely crucial, as as, as Sarah tells us, and and you actually do need to ask some um, some key questions to to get to the bottom of that. Um, and of course, um, another thing that we're we're looking to do, and I, I'd like to bring in actually a. Um, uh, a, a bit of one of the questions we've had on the in the chat here because i think it's relevant to our next question um perhaps um lucy you could start us with this um which was going to be around what what makes a good commercial lawyer but um uh, melinda has asked in the chat as well how are, how are trainees and junior lawyers from your firm prepared to be well positioned to bring clients later in their into their, into the firm for their in, later in their career and i think that's probably something that's quite associated with being a good commercial lawyer as well yeah i completely agree i mean i think one of the things to remember about being a lawyer is that you inherently we are a service industry that we provide services to clients who come to us seeking help with their projects with their problems and i think it's very important to remember that as such you need to be really conscious of your clients needs your clients expectations try and put yourself in your client's shoes i think the days of being able to just be somebody who can literally churn out a bit of law those have gone now to be a really successful lawyer you need to be commercial you need to be thinking around the questions that you are being asked by your client try to be as commercial as you can try to put yourself in their shoes and at the end of the day trying to add value be a solution to what they're coming to you for um, rather than creating more questions for them which is what obviously clients don't, don't want Okay, and um, Claire, you know, as a, we were mentioning the, the the BD part of things, um, what what you know, there's that, but also what 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 perhaps impresses you when you meet a lawyer from the other side? What what do you look out for for saying this somebody is a this this person is is someone worth reckoning with? I think um, along the lines of, of something Lizzie was just saying, it's it's understanding the, the sort of real world pressures on, on things and no, noting that. That there is there are things that your clients are interested in your respective clients that go far beyond just the legal the legal answer um and i i think you can you can tell when someone else has just got that and is just cutting to the chase and, and and getting on with it and i think you know you can often see when lawyers are kind of throwing a bit of mud around to see where it sticks and try and distract you from from the main from the main issues um a sensible lawyer on the other side if we're, we're trying to reach a solution inevitably i mean i'm working litigation so it can get a little bit aggressive and you do get a lot of mud getting thrown around but ultimately you most of the time you are trying to reach some kind of end goal that um that that pleases everybody um and not not throwing unnecessary mud not getting people's backs up trying to un trying to see where my client is coming from and there's a lot of psychology in doing litigation a lot of psychology in, in doing deals um, and all the sorts of things that um, my pan my fellow panelists can talk better about but there's a, there's a lot of um, understanding how people tick um, that goes into all of this yeah okay brilliant um, now uh, another we've got another question here in the um, in the chat which again sort of touches on the next point we're going to look at anyway um, the covid uh, brexit um and the various um you know upsets that we're having in in society and in business etc how are those um you know how are, how are those impacting on on firms and in particular how might somebody joining the profession now think that those might impact on them perhaps in the short term perhaps in the longer term is it all going to be okay or is um is this a a, a major shift so if you could talk to talk about that patrick please sure um, I mean, the question applies at every level because it's it impacted every level of the way we work. It's obviously at, at you know, the firm management level concerns about 
um, whether or not um, we're going to be able to attract the same amount of work, whether the clients are going to be falling off, whether or not people are still going to be using the very top firms, etc., as they come under under pricing pressure. Um, but what we've noticed is that there does seem to have been um, actually, if anything, a bit of an uptick in the amount of work that, that we've seen this year um, and uh, across all of our different teams. So in terms of client demand, it doesn't seem to have impacted too much. And hopefully now with, with vaccines on the horizon, um, there's an end in sight and we will go back to some form of normalization. I don't know if Claire's thinking the same thing, but certainly on the litigation side, we think that once the, the pandemic is behind us, we're likely to see actually an uptick in the amount of litigation that's kind of been pent up during the course of the, of the crisis, um, where people have been focused on just surviving. But once they've survived through the crisis, they'll think about what claims they may have had arising out of the crisis. So at the work demand level, um, no, no concerns. Obviously, on our on our day to day lives, um, the impact has been huge. Uh, our day to day professional lives, you know, not being in the office with our colleagues, um, and as a as the trainee as the trainee principal partner at, at Devoys, it concerns me a lot because we've had new trainees start in September this year, who haven't met their colleagues yet in person. So we've had to think quite a lot about how we can try and recreate the experience of being in the office for them, and obviously. Zoom and video interfacing has helped enormously, but you can't replicate everything. So we've had to, to also think about how you get that sort of soft exposure to picking up just from the way people are doing things. And we try and invite trainees to join phone calls, even if they're just sitting in the background where, you know, that would have probably happened in the office if they were sharing a room with you. Now we kind of add them deliberately to, to Zoom meetings. We try and get um, social events done. So really through thinking outside the box, we're, we're trying to get everyone involved. And also it does it does put a certain onus on trainees and, and associates themselves to actually put themselves forward, to try and make sure they remain involved. And um, there's a lot that the firm can do to make sure people aren't feeling alienated, but there's a lot that individuals can do to stay involved and put their hands up and you know be busy. Um, but it, it sort of takes um, effort from everyone in order to make it work. But as I say, hopefully, in a few uh, months from now, we'll, we'll be heading back towards normality. Well, that's that's good to hear. And of course, yeah, I mean, you mentioned litigation, but but similarly, transactional things um, hopefully will uptick as well as as um, economies recover as well. Um, but I think we can agree that the, the you know the, the the whole COVID experience is has is, is fundamentally going to change the way people work. The uh, the remote side of things um, hopefully opens some new windows. So, Lucy. Um, you know, one of the other things that, that was already changing and, and has been changing for a time now is that what the, the different trajectories of a legal career, um, uh, you know, have developed, um, you know, the, the, the up to partner or out um, is is no longer the only route. So could you give us just give us an idea of how a how a career trajectory might look for someone who's looking at the next 25 years or so? Indeed. I mean, you're right about saying that it's, it's changed when um it used to be the case you'd start somewhere as a trainee, you'd qualify, you would stay at your firm for sort of, you know, 30 years and then you'd retire from the same place, um, which suited some. But I think what is exciting to me about law now is the number of opportunities that it brings to you. So staying within the within a law firm, um, some people choose not to be partner, some people it doesn't make sense for them. There are options now to stay within a firm. As you said, Matt, it's not all about you know, up or out now. Once you've gone through your associate years, there is obviously a partnership option option there for those those that are lucky enough to have it. There's also now a lot of firms. We we at VE offer a council position, which is something that can be a, a stepping stone to partnership, or can be something that people can stay in long term. So it might not necessarily have the same pressures as partnership. It may not have as brutal hours. It, it would be different in some ways. It may allow you to specialise in a particular area of law um, there where partnership is not necessarily um, the right choice within that arena. But then stepping away from firms themselves, also there are options now to go in-house. Corporates now are building their, um, their in-house practices. I mean, historically, there have been quite a lot who've had internal legal functions, but now they are much more prevalent. Um, I certainly have seen, for example, private equity houses, which didn't used to have internal legal, now they have quite a lot. And that is something that you can do even at an early stage now. 
at two or three years, you can step into a role like that and really add value, get more involved in the business side of things. Other options which are now available, accountancy firms, as I'm sure people know, have started up legal arms. There are also um, entities which operate effectively. Um, you, you're employed by them as a lawyer, but you work with different corporates or you go into other law firms on something of an ad hoc basis. That creates an amazing amount of flexibility. And obviously going back to from your legal career into studying is now an option as well. Plenty of people, you know, we've seen it at V&E, people go out and do degrees within business, um, do masters. Um, and that also adds another strain to your bow, which can take you potentially away from the legal side and to the business side. Having done law to start with, I think, shows an amazing tenacity. It shows you can work hard, you can think well, it builds amazing skills, which you can take to another arena, arena should you choose to. Great, thank you. And of course, um, you know, it's well worth asking firms what 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 opportunities they offer. And um, a lot of firms are concerned to talk about the things that they're doing. I mean, Claire, I think RPC have got some um, some new strands that they are, you know, they're pushing quite hard to uh, get people aware of. So could you give us a, a quick look at that? And then we're going to ask about um, something of Sarah about, about women in law. Absolutely. Um, at RPC, we've in the last couple of years changed both the very junior and the very senior end of um our career progression so at the at the junior end we now offer quite a lot of apprenticeships um, and that's for both paralegals solicitors and all across our business development strands um, which is a nice career option um, for for different people um, it also creates an option for people who are not quite sure whether they want to go into law to do the first couple of years and then they still get a qualification and if, if they wanted to leave at that stage they would have something even if they didn't want to continue um, We've also now got a number of people qualifying through equivalent means, so essentially um, being a paralegal for a particular period of time, um, there's a form that they have to fill out to go to the Law Society, um, to the SRA, sorry, um, to demonstrate that they've required, acquired the requisite amount of experience, but it does mean that they don't have to go through the formal training contract process, which can be obviously extremely competitive, so we've had a number of, number of really successful applicants dealing with it that way. At a more senior end of the spectrum, we actually restructured our partnership um, as of the 1st of May this year. So we used to be a completely full equity partnership. Um, we restructured that so now we have um, salaried partners, fixed share equity partners and ec full equity partners. Um, we also have an off council role similar to Lucy was describing, um, which is tends to be people who are very, very technically specialists in a particular area. Um, we, partnership is not for everybody for all sorts of different reasons. Um, it may be that it's something that you don't want the management side to go through to, to get that goes with that you don't want the full financial pressures as Lisa said the hours can be can be tough as a partner not everybody wants to have the full partnership and we found mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we were losing talent at a top level because they didn't want the full equity partnership and um, the other thing that can be a little bit difficult is when you don't have the badger partner to build the business case to be a full equity partner can sometimes actually be quite tricky because building up the following and demonstrating that you can bring in the kind of revenue that a partner would need to bring in it can be difficult with say a senior associate badge um so we've got the option of salaried partner now so people can still have okay. a kind of badger partner and use that to work up if they want to so flexibility is the watchword um workers are more flexible lawyers are more flexible and law firms are more flexible um obviously one of the uh, the the greatest problems that firms have had over the years is uh you know, a dis you know, more women are going into the uh, profession than men, but at the senior levels, uh, there are um, uh, far fewer women. Uh, this has been an endemic problem with uh, with law firm businesses. So, what you know, what does the what's the future look like for that? And does has the COVID change given us any um, any insights there, Sarah? I think um, I think the COVID thing is, is is really interesting because there's some really interesting. Um, reports around has that sort of advanced um, for want of a, a better description the careers of women or has it actually set it back in terms of what are the expectations around at home and you know sharing children responsibilities and is it still ending up on a woman or, or not um i mean certainly at baker's last year we had a joint um partner role given to two females who job share who both do three days a week and from a client perspective they're treated as a, as a single partner and, and are in fact sort of our head of our retail group. So 
I think, I think flexibility is the key word that law firms are certainly looking to get more flexible and, and think outside the box to keep talented people because, you know, to go to Lucy's point, we're a service industry and if we have talented individuals who are delivering service that clients are recognising, then it's, it's an incentive on everyone to, to retain that talent. I guess the one other thing I would add, and it, I slightly, um, I'm saying this conscious that the first thing I went to was, was childcare and COVID. Um, I get frustrated sometimes <clears throat> when we talk about diversity and we talk about, you know, particularly the role of women in law firms is that inevitably the, the, the discussion goes down the childhood and, and maternity leave and children. Um, rabbit hole, so to speak. And I say that as someone who has a four year old child and has, you know, been through that whole process. And in fact, actually, on Monday, I had to go and pick up my son for an alleged tummy bug and had him with me all day yesterday, which was um, delightful, shall I say. Um, but, but the one thing I would highlight is actually it shouldn't just be a women issue, it should be a, a collective issue across the industry. And when we talk about, you know, flexible working, I think so often we're guilty of just talking about it in the context of childcare, whereas actually it should be about recognising what gives people value in what they do. You know, is that going to play football once a week or is that joining a choir or whatever it is? we as an industry i think need to be cognizant that different people have different pressures and it's around the flexibility of making that work with with their career and you know that's not to say it's not difficult it's not to say the hours aren't tough at times but you know it's incumbent on everyone to to make whatever it is that works whether that's childcare or whether that is anything else you're on mute again matt i do apologize um uh, sticking with you, Sarah. Um, also, one well, you know, one of the other areas where we're seeing a lot more flexibility is, um, and 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 certainly it's a, a, a topic that a lot of our, of our um, attendees are talking about is the role of technology, the role of AI. Uh, what's what is are, are things happening there? Um, I think you've got something to say, and then we've got something from Patrick as well. Yeah, so I think you know there's a lot of talk about AI and, and legal tech is bringing you know huge innovation and huge cost settings. You know, I'm sure. Patrick might talk about what it can do in a litigation context, but it's interesting that we have a director or head of technology who sits in um, in Texas and he um, is, is very into the legal tech and what it can, can do. And he used to write for the American lawyer about it. And I was in a meeting with him with a client and he basically turned around and said, no matter how great legal tech is, you can't take a human out of the equation. So I think, you know, whilst there are lots of helpful things that, that tech is giving us, there is always going to be the need for, for human interface. And actually, it probably just means we do the slightly more interesting work. I mean, the other thing I would add is, is, is Bakers have just signed up with um, a sort of a tech innovation startup called Spark Beyond, um, which is about using AI not just in a, a document review or in a, a search, but as a, as a more intuitive problem solving tool to see if it can eradicate making decisions without human bias. Things like that, I think are quite cutting edge. It'll be really interesting to see where they where they go. But um, I, I think to, it is too early to necessarily know for sure. But I think it, the one thing that is clear is we lawyers will still be still be required. So so don't put AI and tech off off applying to, to, to our careers. Uh, uh, uh absolutely and i think yeah that's what what we, we we hear a lot is that the tech is coming um how it how it actually impacts is is still up for grabs i mean patrick i think you had a a specific example of some things around litigation that you said might be happening could you just give us a quick hint of hint of that so there's a lot of what i call relatively low grade ai involved in in litigation at the moment for document production document reviews that kind of thing um, I think if the history of technology in our industry is anything to go by, every time new technology has come in, what it's done is, is it's made us work faster. Uh, so, you know, email and all the rest of it, we just, the pace of work has, has gone up. And I expect that's probably what will continue to happen, but it's not going to replace us, as Sarah says, um, given the complexity of the kind of work that, that we do. Um, we have heard, um, and I've heard others talking about, um, some AI projects that are, uh, coming down um, down the road, which are going to be designed to, for example, give you the opportunity to feed your submissions through um, a review program that will then identify for you based on all of the documents in the record where there are inconsistencies 
um, between your submissions and those documents or in witness statements and the documents um, and equally that can refer you to uh, case cases that might be relevant to you so as that kind of tech gets better and I think IBM has already done some programs to see if it can get a computer to, to predict the outcome of already decided cases to see how accurate it can be so it's clear that there's going to be more um, of that nature coming down the road that will get incorporated into what we do uh, but at the moment I'm pleased to say none of it sounds like it's going to make us um, completely useless. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, also, we, we had a, tech, a question from Miles, actually, that seems relevant to this. Uh, is tech going to impact on people's pricing models? So that may, you know, rather than losing the lawyers, is it going to change how much you charge? Well, at the moment, um, it, it's sort of used to try and get prices down. Um, but it obviously is going to depend on what kind of tech comes in. If there's something that really changes the game, um, but that's very expensive, it'll be interesting to see whether that actually impacts in, in the litigation context, um, the, the quality of the parties and their abilities to, to defend or present their cases on the same footing as their opponents. Great, thank you. Uh, we're running fairly short of time now. Lucy, very quickly, um, what one question we wanted to look at, and I think this has emerged in this year, that, that technology is definitely part of it. Law is an increasingly international occupation. Um, if someone's coming into the profession now, should they expect to be working internationally? Um, do they need to take specific steps to make sure they are, or is that something that's going to probably happen anyway if you're in the commercial field? I think if you're in the commercial field, then it will do. It goes back a little bit to what I was talking about with the classification of firms before. When you're thinking about your career and thinking about the sort of firm that you're targeting, you've got to think about whether you want that to be a global career, a high street firm quite obviously will not have as much of a global reach as one of the larger firms who are working in the city. Um, I, what we are seeing so much more of is people from around the world coming to London. It increases the competition. You've got people who are not necessarily qualified in English law stepping into roles within law firms within England. Um, and I think certainly goes a little bit back to being a commercial lawyer to to work successfully within a large firm, certainly within a city firm, you need to be conscious of the world. It touches on so much of what we do. You know, my deals, for example, 99% of them have a cross-border element within to Europe or into the US or coming out of the US and touching us here. So you need to be globally minded. And that works both, as I say, thinking about where you want to go and thinking about what, who you're pitching against in some ways, who your competition is. Great. Thank you very much. Right. We're, we're down to the two minute warning. So um, the, the, some final thoughts that are, first, I'll just say thank you to everybody now, because we will cut off exactly at, at, at when the, the ticker runs down. Um, a, a quick piece of advice for um, somebody uh, who is just about to start a training contract. If we start with you, Claire, please. Um, I would say communication is really, really important and um, can never be sort of focused upon enough. Um, one of the things that we sometimes see with brilliant trainees is just not quite good enough communication um, letting people know where they are with what they're doing and things like that. So don't forget that it's not just about the technical skills, it's about all the, the wider picture. Great. Sarah? I would say, um, I never, I, I'm switching, sorry, anyways. Um, Do the basics well. Um, if you know, if you don't understand the law the first time and it's new to you, that's fine. You're a trainee. We we expect that. You know, but but where there's sort of basic errors, that's where the frustrations lie. But once you're told something once, remember it and, and move on from there. Um, I think you said me. Um... Uh, we try really hard to give our trainees a voice um, and encourage them to speak up. And I would just really say to everyone, when you come into a firm, take those opportunities, seize the opportunities to um, share your views. And uh, those that do are invariably the most impressive. Great. Thank you very much. And finally, Lucy. Um, it goes a bit to what everybody has said, actually. I think, think to the future. Think about the fact that from the moment you step into a law firm, you are building a presence, building relationships, find your voice and use it, but keep thinking about your career path. Think about your route ahead and where you want to get to. Um, as I say, we are a service industry that's a lot about client focus, it's about building relationships, but that's an internal thing as well as an external thing. Um, find your voice and use it internally as much as you do externally, and that will serve you really well. 
Great. Well, we are bang on time. So thanks again to all, all the um, uh, panel. Um, sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions in the 